Well, we've been talking to you on Wednesday nights about um, prophecy, and we've been, uh, it's been called Prophecy Update, but I've ended up going ahead and doing a review of um, things that are going to happen in the future from, uh, from our point of view. And so, as we learned in the very beginning, the next great prophetic event that's going to happen um, that we see in Scripture is going to be the rapture of the church, and we looked at all of that. We've moved through the tribulation, the things that are going on during the tribulation um, here on the earth, and, uh, and thank God we're raptured before all of that, amen? And then, uh, and then when we're up in heaven, what's going to be going on during that seven years, especially as it's coming to the uh, end of the seven years, the marriage supper of the Lamb that's followed following the um, judgment of rewards um, or the judgment seat of Christ. And, um, and then at the end of the tribulation, what we learned about last week was uh, the battle of Armageddon. You know, everybody's, they want to know about the beast or the Antichrist. They want to know about the, the mark of the beast. We covered that. And then they want to know what happens uh, when he's defeated, and that's the battle of Armageddon. Um, that the Antichrist and his armies are defeated in that great and bloody battle. And, um, and so we're going to pick up following that defeat. Um, Jesus uh, comes in the second coming. Um, he defeats all of the enemies of, uh, of, um, of God and of Israel. And, um, and they're all wiped out. And we know that in that battle of Armageddon that God sent an angel and the angel bound, um, you know, and cast the uh, Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire that burns forever. And, um, and just to pick up, um, you know, we've referred to the chart uh, over, over this time and everything we've been talking about during this series has been from the, rat, from the ascension of Christ, the church age that we're in through the tribulation period this large section, and, uh, and we're going to be moving forward into this part of the, of the prophecy map. But, um, but what happens is that you have, in the underworld, you have hell, or Hades in the Greek, and, um, and that's where the wicked dead, the people who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, where they go. Um, but in the future, there is going to be the lake of fire that burns forever, and the, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into this lake, and that's what we saw during Armageddon. But what we're going to pick up on is what happens to Satan uh, at, that, at that point, and that's, this is where he's going to go, and it picks up in verse 1 of chapter 20, where it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, and had the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And so the angel that's taking care, care of the uh, Antichrist right here, and the false prophet right here, um, now we have an angel that's going to take care of Satan, and he brings a chain. And if you were close enough, you'd see that the, the devil has chains around his neck. He has a chain in his hand, and he lays, lays hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. And so here after 6,000 years of Satan um, just causing torment on this earth, you know, uh, bringing destruction and fear, uh, uh, breaking up families and doing all of the things that he's done, um, he is now, for the first time in 6,000 years, cast into this bottomless pit. He's bound and cast into the bottomless pit. He is shut up. In uh, verse 3, it says he cast him in the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him, and so he's, he's marked uh, that he's going to stay. But then it says, but after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, we've mentioned during this series that God gave from the time of his plan of the ages, and I'm going to switch sides on the map here, um, that when we had the Garden of Eden, this is eternity past, when we have the Garden of Eden where in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, um, the earth was without form and void, darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And then God began His creation account. And for six days He created 
all of the creation of the universe. And on the seventh day, it says the Lord rested. You know, of course, the sixth day was when man was created. And that, that began um, a 6,000-year period. And again, I started to say that in the weeks past, at some point I mentioned that a prophetic day, a day with the Lord is a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is a day. And so just imagine, just, just picture that God had, had a seven-day plan, a 7,000-year plan. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, when the serpent deceived Eve and then she convinced Adam to eat and they both partook of the knowledge of good and evil right here, that sin entered the world. And what they in effect did was Adam, who was appointed the head of the creation and to have the, the creation in subjection to him to subdue the earth, um, that he turned that lease that authority over to the devil. And so a 6,000 uh, year period um, is taking place, and, uh, and that's the six days. And so the devil, for these 6,000 years at this point in, in recorded history from the time of Adam, that, that the devil has been causing havoc on the earth. He's been the enemy. And he's tried to hinder the, the plan of God for 6,000 years. And that goes all the way to the end of the church age. Okay? And, uh, and actually, the conclusion of the last seven years of that um, uh, prophetic week that we talked about, um, it was seen in, in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. It was seen in the prophecy, speaking of 70 weeks that God gave to Daniel. And uh, at the conclusion of this, it goes into a thousand-year period called the millennial reign, and it's peace on the earth. God rested from creation on the seventh day, and with Satan bound, we have a period of rest in this, this last day of the creation, or the last thousand years of prophetic time. And, uh, and that will conclude those seven days that the creation is a type of. And that will usher us into eternity future. So here we have um, this thousand year period, which is, is a, an equivalent to the seventh day of creation in that type. And uh, we have peace and we can rest because Satan's bound. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And so there's where Satan is. And so let's pick that up in verse number four where it talks about us here on the earth. Because we came back with Jesus, remember, in the Battle of Armageddon? And there's Jesus in the front on his horse, and ten thousands of thousands upon thousands of his saints, in other words, countless numbers of saints that are coming behind him, the army of the Lord, even though we don't have to do battle. Jesus takes care of it. The Word of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Remember his cool outfit with his name on it? And so he comes down and we come with him. And so we're ready to go into this period. And that picks up in verse number uh, seven. Where, I'm sorry, verse number four, where it says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been headed for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or the image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or, in their hand, or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So us, the tribulation saints, all the righteous, from the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, even the tribulation saints, we all are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. It says, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. I know this is where we left off last week, but I wanted to pick it up at the millennium. So the wicked dead are remaining in hell, or Hades. So they're still there. Um, the righteous that you saw before um, Jesus ascended into heaven, the righteous were in the inner part of the earth, and in this side uh, there was a great pit separating them. And you see that in the story of the rich man and Lazarus in the book of Luke. Um, so this is emptied out at the ascension of Christ, and, um, and, and the saints that were in hell 
um, and the paradise side of the pit, um, you know, the paradise side of Hades, there's the pit and then there was paradise. It's here now. And so uh, it was emptied out. And the Bible says, hell hath enlarged her mouth. And so what happens was, you know, all the Old Testament saints went up um, with Jesus when he ascended, um, and hell just, just overflowed the whole thing. And I, and I think, you know, um, there's just been so many people. The population of the, wor- the world has exponentially increased with every uh, millennia that's went by. So you can say, why, you know, 4,000 years up to that point, um, uh, um, why is it enlarged its mouth in full? Because the next 2,000 years, the population of the earth has just continued to expand, and many, many wicked, many, many that have rejected the Lord have, uh, have went down, and it's just overflowed with them. Um, but they're remaining here during this 1,000-year period. And... Um, and so that's the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. So the fact that we are alive in this first resurrection to live in the millennium, we don't worry about the second death. That's eternal judgment. That's going to be where everybody goes to the lake of fire, you know, forever that didn't accept the Lord. And so the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and shall reign with him for a thousand years. And as we said, you know, over the weeks, that um, in the in the temple, not the temple that is going to be built, that Satan's going to go in and pollute, um, but he'll, he'll have a temple, and, and Jesus is going to go in, and he's going to reign and, over the earth. He's going to be the leader of the planet, um, and isn't that going to be something? And uh, it's a thousand years of peace and blessing, and and uh, and it's going to be wonderful. Christ is going to reign, but it says right here in verse number six that we are going to reign with Him for a thousand years. And that's where I talked about different people having, you know, different functions. We don't know what we'll do, but we're going to reign. So we're going to have responsibility in it. Heaven is not. Um, sitting on a cloud and playing a harp forever, you know. Um, that's just that's just uh, foolish traditions. Now, we're going to spend this thousand years with Jesus ruling the earth, and it's going to be wonderful peace. Um, but the thousand years end, and that's the end of the lease on the earth. And so Satan's been bound for this season of a thousand years. But he has to be loosed for a season because Satan has a legal access to mankind because we surrendered ourselves over to him. We, um, we turned this earth over to him. And so God sets before everyone life and death and blessing and cursing. He tells us to choose life, to live in his will, and to walk in his ways. But people don't. And the fact that people don't, they're not during this thousand years also. They're going to rebel in their heart. They're going to, you know, it's, I, I always say it like this. I just always have this image because to me I marvel. I can't imagine, you know, in history we've had benevolent rulers, presidents and kings and prime ministers and national leaders that we have, you know, heard about and, we thought, wow, what a, what a great time, what a great era, you know, in, in history. But there's nothing compared to Jesus Christ and Him ruling the world. Can you imagine? He rules in absolute love and, and absolute justice. It's just, it's just wonderful. As we've seen described during this thousand years, the lion's gonna lie down with the lamb. Um, in other words, creation, um, is going to be uh, restored to like it was in the initial part of creation. Um, animals were not corn- carnivores. And so all the animals ate vegetation. And, uh, and then when sin entered the world and the fall came, it affected creation and the animal kingdom as well. 
Um, but during the millennial reign, the lion's not going to eat the lamb anymore. It's going to lie down with the lamb. It'll graze on, on vegetation. Um, so that'll be restored. So you have even the animal kingdom back at peace. So I guess that means that mosquitoes aren't going to bite us anymore. Mm. You know, Georgette was telling me that, that she, had a, she found a rattlesnake in her yard uh, and told, her, told me to be watching for rattlesnakes when I'm out here mowing. And, um, and it was just a little one and she got rid of it and hadn't seen one since, but it was, you know, a week ago. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't have to worry about rattlesnakes. See, a rattlesnake's not going to bother you. You know, because the animal creation is going to be restored. It says man's not going to be at war anymore because they're going to take their weapons, their swords, and, 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 and their shields and things, and they're going to melt them down and turn them into pruning hooks, uh, pitchforks, and hoes, you know, uh, things to, pl- to, to do vegetation and all. It's, it's just an imagery of peace. No more war. And, you know, we've had um, times we consider ourselves more at peace than others, but just in the history of the United States, we've almost always been at war. And even now, where we don't have a massive war going on, we've been drawing down troops quite a bit, we still are at war. You know, we still have troops in uh, harm's way in different places and, um, and, and are at risk when they're over there. And so... So we've been in, in, in conflict, and whether the, and that's just the United States, but around the world there's always been wars, you know, and rumors of war. So it's, you're in a war, or there's a rumor there's about to be another war. And, uh, and you know, and, and that's just always the way it's been. But here, no war on the whole planet. So all the weapons are going to be meaningless and melted down and made into other things. That's the millennial reign. And it's going to be wonderful and peaceful. But, um, but the thousand years expire, and during that time, people may, and this is why I started to say that I always get this picture of, where Dr. Dobson shared this, uh, you know, t- probably about 30 years ago now, but he shared on his radio broadcast of uh, a person who was being obedient, you know, and he, but he's talking about, you know, the, it was in the strong-willed child, I believe, and when he was teaching that, and he wrote the book, and he's talking about, you know, this strong-willed child, you know, you, you can get them to sit down. You say, you know, you sit right there. You know, whether it's a timeout chair, you just sit there, you know, until I tell you you can get up. And, and he said that in, in, <laughs> in the book, or on the radio, he's telling the story. He said, uh, there's this little kid, and, and, and he gets him to sit down. The parent gets him to sit down. And the kid says, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. You know, <laughs> and that picture is is what I always think about because at the end of the thousand years Satan's going to be loose for a season because there are going to be people who are rejecting Jesus Christ during this period and uh, and and anyone who sins the wages of sin is death that's spiritual death separation from God where they will be removed from um, from from God and his creation and so that takes us to verse 7. It says, When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and he'll go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together, together to battle, whose number is of the sand of the sea. And they went up on, on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Now just picture this. He goes out. Uh, the deceiver of the nations and says, all right, hey, I'm God. You, you don't want to live for Jesus. You don't want to follow Him. You want, you want an alternative? Follow me. And they will. <laughs> They'll reject Jesus and say, I don't want any part of this goody two-shoes life and goody two-shoes ruler. You're cool. You know how many movie and TV shows have you seen where people are like, I'll see you in hell and you know, um, you know, hey, I don't want to go to heaven. I'm going to hell where the partying's going on. It ain't no party. That is one of the great deceptions that Satan has brought about. He deceives people into believing that there is no hell. And he deceives so many people into believing, yeah, but that's where all the cool kids go. That's where, where the partying's going to happen. Christians are going to go up and strum on a harp for a billion, zillion years. How boring is that? They're going to sit on a puffy cloud, 
play their harp, you know, and it's going to be boring. And, uh, and people get deceived and follow. And that's what's happening. He's deceived people and he gathers them together and says, let's get rid of him. I'll rule the world. Let's get rid of him. Over and over, he's trying the same thing. And so he says, let's do this. So, the, so he gathers together an army of these people, these rebels, and they come to surround the holy city where Jesus is ruling the world from. And, and it says that they, he comes to the camp of the saints, you know, and, and uh, we're uh, in the beloved city. And then it says, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So in Armageddon, Jesus conquers the army of the Antichrist and the false prophet. At the end of the millennium, God the Father just sends fire down and wipes out all of these people who have rejected His Son who's ruled with nothing but love and justice for a thousand years. And it says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire um, and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. See, we remember, they're already there. And so, uh, um, so now Satan's going to be cast into that place as well. And it says, and they will be in torment day and night forever. So then what happens? We still have all the people who have rejected the Lord Jesus over the millennia that are, that are here, um, including those that have died during this time. They, they die, and what happens is they die, and their spirits are going to be brought before God in what is called the great white throne judgment. How many of you have ever heard that term, white throne judgment? Well, in, in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11, we see what that is. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and I want you to listen to this, and books, plural, were opened. It says the, the dead, small and great. You know, from the, from the, the simplest person, in, as far as the world's concerned, uh, the simplest of sinners, to great uh, sinners like Hitler and, and you know, uh, Charles Manson and whoever else you want to think of. The dead, small and great, all the dead that had rejected the Lord, didn't accept Jesus Christ, um, they're going to stand before God. And books are going to be open. Then it says, and another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades um, delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. The books are the record of the sins of the dead that are not in Christ. The dead, um, you, we say the wicked dead. And so they're going to be judged according to their, their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anybody that's in this place, it's, it's over. I mean, the Bible says... It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. So you you live a, a, a life on this earth and and re reject Jesus Christ, judgment happens and you you go to hell today at this point. But in the future, at this point, at the end of the millennium, death and hell are going to release everybody's coming out of there. Everybody that's died, and this picture is everywhere. No one, no, no, no one hidden. There's no, no person that's died that's going to escape the judgment of God. Um, you know, uh, we, we have uh, TV shows where there's always like that one person survives in the end, or a small group of a few people survive, and they regenerate the population of the earth and, and all of that. That's science fiction. That's all, all fiction. Um, there is no one that's going to escape judgment or reward. And so they're all going to come to the white throne judgment. They're going to be judged according to their works. 
And, uh, and so death in Hades um, opens up, and the second death, where they're judged according to their works, leaves them in verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life, the book, was cast into the lake of fire. So at this white throne judgment, the people who have lived through the millennium are going to have their judgment and give account to the Lord. And there is a book that is open, the Lamb's Book of Life, and if your name's written in that book, you have eternal life. But if you've rejected the Lord and your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, if you've not confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll be judged by the books. Now, to me, this is just this image of God as the just judge. Because in reality, we could say that rejection of Jesus Christ, that's the sin unto death. That's the one that's going to separate you from God. Because all of us have sinned. All of us, even after being a Christian, you know, um, we'll miss the mark, we'll sin, we confess our sins to God. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. Sin is part of the life of human beings on this planet because of the sin nature that came in as a result of what Adam did 2,000 years ago. Sin entered mankind, the, the sin nature. And so we've all sinned. The difference is um, our name's written in the book of life. And that's what counts. But in God's justice, and this is the image that I've always had, that these people are going to stand before God and they're going to say things like, well, well, you know, I was a good person. I did more good than bad. I didn't, I didn't rob any banks. I didn't rape anybody. I didn't commit murder. You know, come on. On the scale of things, I deserve, you, you are unjust. You have no right to send me to hell with the devil and with hell. Uh, you know, no way. I was a good person. Now, they're not going to go to heaven because their name's not written in the book. But God in His justice will open the books and it will record all of their sin. And, you know, and I've shared this illustration over the years. All of you that are here know it. Maybe you that are watching have never heard me share this illustration. But um, if, you know, in, in Evangelism Explosion, they taught us uh, uh, an illustration called Three Sins a Day. And it just shows us that um, sin is, is just a horrible, destructive thing. And so, in the illustration, it says, imagine you sin, you know, only 10, 15 times a day. You'd be a pretty good person. And, you know, in 24 hours, only sinning 10 times, 15 times, that's not even once an hour. And, you know, when you take into consideration sin, that's, that's everything you do wrong or that you fail to do right in. It's, it's thoughts that you think that are inappropriate. You know, and it's, it's, it's um, uh, you know, the things, again, the things you do and the things that you should have done that you didn't do, thoughts that you think that you shouldn't have thought, you know, and so it's, it's words that you spoke, it's, you know, words, deeds, actions, thoughts, all of this is sin life. Now, we all know that we, we've sinned, haven't we? And, and most people would say, you know, so over a 24-hour period, I mean, you can just drive from, from church to home and sin five times. I've seen Graham cuss out the people, you know, cutting them. No, I'm just, just kidding, just kidding, you know, just kidding. But how many of you know, I mean, we can just get into a little road rage, you know, and start talking to the person that's cutting you off. Or they're going too slow, you know. He can get home thinking, man, I'm tired, I'm wore out. He's got this expectation that Christy is dressed in this, in this outfit that's just ready for date night. And, and she's got a meal. She cooked a meal in that dress and didn't get any gravy on it or anything. And she's got her hair and her makeup and everything's going and the house is ready. And he's just, he, he's got, he's just expecting the perfect night. And she's just waiting for him. Graham! 
honey, welcome home. She's got her little apron on like June Cleaver. And come in and, and have your meal and, and, and let me rub your back and, and, and bring you some tea and just watch a movie and then we'll just do this. And he's got this image. And then he gets home and she's got her bathrobe on and, you know, and her pajama shorts on. She's been too tired to cook anything. And so, you know, he's ready. He missed lunch. He's, he's ready to eat. And, and he can sin. Whether it's in his thoughts, whether it's in his words, hopefully, you know, not, not, you know, any other way. And, and, and so we all know that just sinning 10 times a day, 15 times a day, it's easy to sin. So most people say that's not, that's a pretty good person. What if you sin, you know, only five times a day? Five times in 24 hours? Wow. What if you only sin three times a day? Well, you'd be practically a walking angel. And, and in this illustration it says, so think about that, three sins a day. I mean, that's like a walking angel considering all things that can be a sin. And so, um, but three sins a day, if you live the average life of 70 plus years, 70 years after you've grown to the age of knowing what sin is, and you live 70 years and you only sin three times a day, well, three times a day over one year is over 1,000 transgressions. Three times 365 is, is over 1,000. So that's over 1,000 sins. And over 70 years, that's over 70,000 violations of the law of God on your record written in the book. Now, if you go to a judge at the county courthouse and you've got a, book, a, 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 you know, a, a rap sheet with 70,000 priors and you say, Judge, I'm a good person. You ought to let me go. That judge isn't going to put you in jail. He's going to bury you under the jail. That's how the illustration goes. And so, that's the justice of God. That He takes this book and they see all that they've done. And it's going to be a lot more than three sins. It's going to be horrible. And in that, they'll have to just drop their head in shame and cannot say, you're an unjust judge. They'll say, holy is the Lord. Your judgment is true. They can't, they, they can't do it. So the, the, the thing that's keeping them out of heaven is their name's not written in the Lamb's book of life. But God's not going to just say, well, you didn't accept my son, but you were a good person. I'm going to still send you to torment forever. No, there's books that shows all of the transgressions. And they're going to know, I deserve this. Isn't that something? This is the white throne judgment that's going to occur at the end of the thousand years. And anyone not found in that book of life, they're all going to be cast into the lake that burns with fire forever. And then Revelation gets really exciting. The millennial reign is pretty awesome, isn't it? But listen to Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Now we are at the, at the um, place of eternity future. It's the end of the map, and the reason why it just is cut off is because it just goes forever. So there's no completed circle. This goes on forever and ever. And it's a new heaven and a new earth. And what you see in this chart is going to be this baptism of the earth in fire. See the flame between the old earth and the, the new heaven and the new earth? So, we're going to all see the earth and the heaven, you know, the atmosphere, all the pollution, all of the things that it's not the way God originally created it. It's totally new. And it says that there's no more sea. So we, we, we're used to this blue planet with you know um, all the oceans and the seas and things like that. There's no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so, in the new heaven and the new earth, when everything's purified, it's completely recreated back to a special creation of God. Can you imagine? No. 
We can't. It's going to be amazing. And the New Jerusalem, you know, in 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 in, his, in Hebrew um, culture, in the Hebrew mystics and Hebrew culture, they have been looking for the Jerusalem that is above. They call it Yerushalayim, which is above. They've known about a heavenly Jerusalem all along. And it says that the new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven um, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God is going to dwell with us for all of eternity. The tabernacle of God is going to be with us. Oh, hallelujah, the holy of holies. is get, it, It's here in this new heaven and new earth, and we're going to live with God for all of eternity. Um, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no pain, for the former things have passed away. It's all over. All of, the, all of the sadness, all of the tragedy, all of the pain, all of the sickness, the whole curse of the law has been dealt with and it's done. It's over. And it's just all blessing and all glory, the presence of God Himself, because nothing imperfect is there. Not a remnant of sin is left. And so holy God can dwell with man. It's all passed away. And then He who sat on the throne, verse 5, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. Write this down. It's true. It's faithful. I'm going to make sure that it comes to pass. Make sure that it happens. Now, just to, just to throw a freebie out for you, for those of you, you know, I love science fiction. I've seen every Star Trek episode of every Star Trek series up until the current one that's on CBS. Um, well, actually, there's two. I started to watch that Picard on there, got the access, and, and within two or three episodes, Captain Picard let the F-bomb come out of his mouth. And then I looked at the rating, and it made it TV mature. So it's like, well, they've destroyed Star Trek for me. Since I've been a kid, I've watched every Star Trek. And they ruin that. Gene Roddenberry's picture of, <laughs> of, of, of <laughs> the future um, was gone. And whoever's doing the Star Treks now, it's a totally different thing. So I haven't seen, um, there's a current series and then that Picard. I haven't seen those. But all the other Star Treks, I've watched them. And you know, and it's, and, and it's cool. All the alien life forms, the Klingons and the Romulans and yeah, I mean, there's so many life forms that they've seen as they went on their five-year mission that turned into multiple years, <laughs> you know, and they've been going on and on for, for all of this time and, and meeting all of these people, some good, some bad. It's all fiction. It's science-based fiction. In reality, I don't believe there are aliens. And why don't I believe there are aliens? Because you picture, God's created all these planets. I know this universe is big and everything, crazy planets, and aliens are on them, right? But it says He's going to come down here, put His tabernacle on earth with men, and He's going to be our God. We're going to be His people, and He's going to be our God. He's going to dwell with us for eternity. Isn't that sad that He would leave out all of the other created uh, beings on all of the other planets, the Klingons and the Romulans and the... You know, the Ferengis and all of the different... I'm thinking of all the enemies, you know. Uh, you know, the... <laughs> but, but, you know, he's, he's, but, but all of them have no, you know, no hope, no salvation, no God, because there's just one Jesus, one God, and He's dwelling with us. So I don't think, you know, that God's, you know, like that. He's not going to abandon all of those people that are flying around in UFOs and observing us. Abandon them and just be with us. That wouldn't be very... God-like of him, would it? So I just personally don't think they're aliens. That's free. It's an opinion. Do with it what you want. But that's one of the reasons why I don't believe in aliens. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these things are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
the first letter of the Greek al alphabet, the last letter. We could say it like this, I am the A and I am the Z. I am the beginning and I am the end. I am everything. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. We're going to drink of, you know, the fountain of youth, the fountain of life that, you know, that the fiction talks about. It's real, but it's different. It's the fountain of life, and we're going to drink of it for all of eternity. And the reason why that fountain of life is important is there are human beings that, that lived on this earth during the millennium. And the Bible tells us that the, that the tribulation saints are going to be raptured. So we can assume they're going to get a glorified body, like we're going to get a glorified body um, when the rapture happens. So everybody up to this point has gotten a glorified body, but, but it doesn't say that about here. And so some speculate, and I think it kind of makes sense, well, this fountain of life, the fountain of life that's going on, what is that doing? That's keeping them alive forever. You know, it, it's, 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 there's a tree. Well, let's just read. So you get the fountain of life, and they're going to drink from it freely who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Don't you love how God just keeps saying that? He just, he just, I'm his, and you're mine. I'm yours, you're mine. It's one. It says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murder, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's just a reminder that even when we think about this eternity future that we're going to go in and there's no sin that's left, that anybody that's living in a sinful life, the books are recording all of that. And you're not going to participate in this because of what's written in the books. And it's just that sober reminder. Because contrary to what, the, what many modern churches want to do and say, don't talk about sin, that's a sin mentality. People won't want to come to your church. You're stepping on their toes and they just want to be built up and life is good and here's how to live a great life and everything's perfect and all of that. And there's no... It's, it's, no. There is sin and people need to understand that there's sin and they need to be... Uh, um, reminded of it, and prophetic teaching, as we've taught, the rapture could happen at any moment. That's a blessed hope, a purifying hope. I don't want to be in the middle of committing sin when Jesus appears. Just think of whatever sin. You're drunk at the bar. You're just so lit up. You're bent over the table. Or you're in the bathroom puking it up, and, and, and the rapture comes. I don't want to be in a place like that. And so that's a purifying hope. But even as we reflect on this eternity future, there's a reminder, nobody that's lived a sinful life is going to be there. And so it tells us we want to live a holy life. That's why teaching prophecy is important. Because there is a long, beautiful future for the child of God. Where he, become, he is our God and we are His child. But sin can keep us from that promise, from that future. I want to spend eternity with Him in a new heaven and a new earth. I don't want to spend eternity with Him. And we're either going to spend eternity, um, you know, from the great white throne judgment because our name's here, and we're going to spend eternity with this new temple where He's going to be our God, um, with our God here or our God there. Sinner, that's their God. Saint, that's their God. And it's the truth. Whether you like it or not, whether you like me for saying it or not, this is the truth. Jesus said it's faithful. It's true. It's going to come to pass. So then it picks up in uh, Revelation um, uh, 21, verse 9. It talks about this new Jerusalem. And I told you there's a Jerusalem above. Then the one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with seven last plagues came to me and talked with me and said, Come, I show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me a great city, the holy 
Jerusalem descending out of the heaven of God from God. So here's this heavenly Jerusalem, and in in Jewish religion and Jewish even the Jewish mystics talks about the Jerusalem above. I remember one teacher saying, when I saw that, and I was talking to the Jewish people, the Orthodox Jews in Israel, and they were talking, and I was telling them about Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem, they're like, oh yes, Yerushalayim above. They knew about it. It's like, yeah, and she's, and it was like, yeah, it's there. And she was amazed. And I just think that's exciting. And so it says that he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of the heaven from God, having the glory of God. This city has the glory of God. And her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. So this, there's, it's a square, and there's three gates on each, each one, and you're going to see why there needs to be three. <laughs> now the wall of the city was, had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So the, the walls, you know, had the twelve tribes of Israel. The foundations are the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length, um, I just lost my place. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. And the breadth, uh, the length, the breadth, and the height are equal. Now, you're talking about 1,380 miles in each direction, including vertical. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, so according to the measure man, that is, a, uh, that is a, the angel that measured. The construction of the wall was of, jas- was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like, uh, like clear glass. This new heaven, new earth, and this new Jerusalem, the gold is so pure, it's translucent. No impurity in it. It's gold, but it's, it's clear, like glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. And the first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the fifth, uh, sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, and the tenth uh, chiroprase, and the eleventh uh, jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And twelve gates... The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. Now, Pastor Lisa has an image that this this pearl is is you know the height of the wall. Uh, I don't know how tall it is, but it's it's big enough for people to go through, you know. And it's not going to be some little you know interior closet kind of door. It's going to be a grand entrance kind of door. So imagine these gigantic pearls. And uh, and it says the street of the city was pure gold like translucent glass. And here's the glory of the new Jerusalem. But I saw no temple in it. So up until now there's been temples because we've been in the 7,000 year period of creation. But now we're in eternity future with a completely new heaven and earth. And, and it says there's no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The Lord God and the Lamb are the temple. The city had no need of a sun or of moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. So no no sun and moon to to light things up anymore. God is the light. (laughs) And all the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth uh, bring their glory and honor to it. The gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall not be any night there. That's just a parenthesis. It says the gates will never be shut by day. Um, and, and what he's saying is there's never night. So in other words, the gates are never shut because there's no thieves anymore. There's no robbers. There's no things to worry about. God is open. The throne room is available. 
um, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and there shall be no, uh, and there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, which is everybody that goes. And so there's no none of that. All the liars, all the sinners, all the all the wicked that have rejected God, the atheists that have have uh, hated God and denied God, and and you know um, people who said I my life and what I want to do is more important to me than 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 God and what He's saying of me, you know, and they and they reject Him and His ways. None of them will be there. It'll just be open to all of us who are written in the book of life. And then verse uh, chapter 22, as we wrap it up, he showed me the pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, uh, each, uh, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And um, and there'll be no more curse, no more throne of God, and the Lamb shall be in it, the servants shall serve them, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them life, and they shall reign forever and ever. So here we have this river and a tree that 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 goes to both sides, and and three times, you know, um, three kinds of plants, you know, um, uh, at different times of the year are going to bring healing to the nations. And there's a different kind of fruit every month. So you have, you know, and this is an example, I don't know if there'll be any fruit that we know. Let's say apples in January, because there's no winter or anything either. Apples in January, there's going to be oranges in February and bananas in in uh, um, March, and April's going to have oranges again because, you know, no, I'm just kidding. There'll be 12 different fruits. And, uh, and the, and the, and the, and the leaves are for the healing of nations. Well, what nations? The nations of people who lived through the, the tribulation and went into the, or through the millennium and went into the, um, eternity future. So, uh, it'll keep their bodies alive. They'll drink of the water of life. They'll eat of these nations that keep, you know, their bodies, uh, healthy and living for eternity. And so, uh, so they'll go on and on. And, uh, and, and they'll live in the light of God. Now, here's the sobering conclusion. And then, again, prophecy um, does this for us. Then he said, These words are faithful and true. The Lord God of the, Lord God of the Holy Prophet sent his angels to show his servants these things, which must shortly, come to, uh, shortly take place. 2,000 years ago, John was told this, and it's going to come shortly. And two days is a short amount of time. But 2,000 years, how that is, in God's eyes, that's nothing. But 2,000 years has felt long, but I'm going to tell you something, it's very short. Those 2,000 years are coming to a conclusion, and it will shortly take place. So verse 7 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Live that holy life. Live for me. Accept me as your Savior, and you'll be in my book of life. It says, verse 8, Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshipped before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And he said, See that you don't do that. He fell down worshipping an angel. Don't do that, for I am your fellow servant of your brethren the prophets and those who keeps the words of this book. Worship God. Only God is, is to be bowed before and worshipped. Only God is to be bowed before and worshipped. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. This book is open because the time is at hand. He didn't say, close it, keep it secret. He has put that out for all of us to live a life in line with this, this book so that we would be ready. Our name would be in the Lamb's book of life. And then he said, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Make up your mind. Be what you want. This word is true. It is coming to pass. And he says, and, and so he, sober reminder, again, God's always letting us know that sin is real and sin is destructive. But that he says, be holy be a child of God, and with my righteousness, you're going to make it into eternity. 
And then again, he goes back to this, verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Remember, he's coming back with that judgment of rewards. He's going to reward us according to his work in the judgment seat of Christ. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then here's this blessing. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter through the gates of the city. But outside are dog sorcerers, sexually immoral, immoral murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. He just he always gives us that sobering contrast. Outside of this promise, outside of this holy, beautiful place is going to be the unrighteous. They will not go in. They will not have access. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who him who thirsts uh, come, and whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify, everyone that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the books, words of the book of this prophecy of God, uh, shall, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things written in this book. We cannot add to the Bible. We cannot take away from the Bible. There are so many people that are doing that. They're rewriting the Bible. They're taking out what they don't like, and they're putting in what they do. And you will be judged and you will end up having all the plagues and all the judgment that this book talks about. But he who testifies to these things says once again, how many times is Jesus going to say it? Surely I am coming quickly. And then John says, Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And can we say that tonight? Even so, come quickly Lord Jesus. Let's do that again. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you may have been saying that over your lifetime as a believer, but it is just, you can, you can feel the reverberation of it. It's coming so close. we got to close in prayer. Next week we'll get into um, current events and things like that and then open into uh, a question and answers and, and go forth from there. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for all of us who have called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, confessed with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. We believed in our heart that you have raised him from the dead, that he is the Son of God, and that because of that we live forever. Our names are written in the book of life. I pray for anyone who hears this message that doesn't know you, to just say, Lord, I have sinned. I am sorry. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's your son. I believe that he forgives sin. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin tonight. Deliver me from the law of sin and death. And write my name in your book of life. And my Lord, I thank you that if they just prayed that prayer, they're saved. They're in going to heaven. They're going to enter into this eternity. And we rejoice and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I would love it if you'd let me know about it. I want to rejoice with you. If I can help you along your walk, in your early days, walk with Jesus, that would be wonderful. One thing I would encourage you to do is read one chapter a day from the book of John, and over the next few weeks you'll get to know your Lord and Savior even better.